Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Institute of Public Knowledge um, on this rather gorgeous almost spring <laughs> day. Um, thank you for coming out and joining us in launching the Coping AI series. My name is Mona Sloan. I am a sociologist here at the IPK, and I'm in the convener of the Coping AI series. Um, my own work focuses on the sociology of design and inequality in the context of artificial intelligence design and policy. Now, before we begin, and I introduce our amazing panel, um, I just want to take the opportunity and say a few words um, about why I think we're here today and why I think we need to talk about co-opting AI. Now, the thing that we call AI, and it's really rather unclear what artificial intelligence really is at this point, or it can be. Um, AI is everywhere, it seems, playing a role in what kinds of ads are displayed to us on social media, whether we receive a loan or not, whether we get that job interview, how we navigate the city, and so on. Now, as these digital technologies penetrate our social lives, we are somewhat engulfed in a narrative that positions AI as inevitably determining our collective future, for better and for worse. We must fear the arrival of the robots. They will take our jobs before they entirely take over as our new artificial overlords. That's the biggest threat AI poses to society or so we're told. But whether you believe in the possibility of a robotic autocardia or not, I think the real threat is already here. Autarky, sorry. The real threat is that with all the noise around AI, I think that we miss what really is at stake. AI prompts us to reevaluate big questions relating to power, democracy, and inequality, and really what it means to be human. I think we must co-opt co the AI discourse to keep asking these questions, and to ask these questions from a social and political point of view, not just from an economical and technological one. Failing to do so, that is the real threat society faces, not the robots. At least that's what I think. And really, this is what the Co-opting AI series is all about, flipping the AI script and taking the AI hype as a cue to have broader conversations about society, design, technology, inequality, and democracy. And this is really well within AP IPK's tradition of being a place for cultivating public debate around public concerns. Now tonight, we're kicking off the Co-opting AI series by having a closer look at well, what algorithmic machines, or AI, can and cannot do, and how this is interlinked with society's histories and hierarchies. And so without further ado, please let me introduce our distinguished panel tonight. First up, we have Meredith Broussard, who is at the forefront of critical data journalism. She's an assistant professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at NYU, a 2018 Reynolds Journalism Institute Fellow, and the author of Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. Her research focuses on artificial intelligence in investigative reporting with a particular interest in using data analysis for social good. Her newest project explores how future historians will read today's news on tomorrow's computers. A former features editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, she also worked as a software developer at ATT Bell Labs and the MIT Media Lab. Her feature essay, features and essays have appeared in the Atlantic, Harper, Slate, and other outlets. Then we have Solon Barocas, who is one of the key figures in the emerging field of fairness in data science. He currently is a researcher in the New York lab of Microsoft Research and an assistant professor in the Department of Information Science at Cornell. He is also a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. His current research explores ethical and policy issues in artificial intelligence, particularly fairness in machine learning, methods for bringing accountability to automated decision making, and the privacy implications of inference. He co-founded the annual workshop on fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning, and later established the ACM conference on fairness, accountability, and transparency. He's also currently writing a book um, on fairness in machine learning, together with Moritz Hart, 
and Arvind Naran again. Then, our next speaker is Finn Brunton, who is a very versatile media theorist who has written extensively about a multitude of media-related, historically rooted topics, including surveillance and obfuscation, as well as cultural history of spam. Finn currently is Assistant Professor of Media, Culture and Communication at NYU Steinhardt. As a scholar of the relationship between society and information technology, he's interested in how we make technological decisions and deal with their consequences. He focuses on the adaption, modification and misuse of digital media and hardware, privacy, information security and encryption, network subcultures, hardware literacy, and obsolete and experimental media platforms. He has also written quite a bit. He has written um, spam, a shadow history of the internet, obfuscation, um, a user guide to privacy and protest together with Helen Nissenbaum. And he has not one but two books coming out in 2019. No pressure to those of you who are academics. Um, the first one is called, is solo authored and is called Digital Cash, the unknown history of anarchists, technologists and utopians who created cryptocurrency. And he has also co-authored Communication with Mercedes Bunz and Paula Bialski with the University of Minnesota Press. Now, our first speaker tonight is Meredith. Please join me in welcoming Meredith to the stage. Thank you, Mona, and thank you, IPK. It is really exciting to be here tonight. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm particularly uh, excited to, uh, to talk with my co-panelists uh, because one of the things that I do in my book, Artificial Unintelligence, is I look at our ideas about digital utopia uh, and look at where they came from. Uh, so Finn, I'm excited to hear about the, uh, the cryptocurrency uh, not balls. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some ideas in the book. Uh, one of the things that I do in the book is I do define artificial intelligence because I think it's really important uh, when we're having conversations about AI and the future, I think it's really important to be talking about exactly the same thing. So if I'm talking about machine learning, which is a statistical process, and you're talking about killer robots, which are a fantasy, uh, then if we're trying to have a real conversation, especially a policy-based conversation, we're, it's just not going to work. So I think it's important to have everybody on the same page and also to be really clear about what terms mean. So let's talk a little bit about cultural fantasies about AI. And I, I'm really interested in this because I do love technology. I, I don't love the hype about technology, but I do love technology. I love building things, and I've been uh, building things with computers uh, ever since I was little. I started my career as a computer scientist, and then I quit to become a journalist, specifically a data journalist. So I find stories and numbers and use numbers to tell stories, and I write computer code in order to commit acts of investigative journalism. So I want you to think for a second about AI and think about who or what pops into your head. And probably it's something like this, right? Like probably you thought about stock art robot guy, or maybe you thought about the Terminator. Uh, maybe you thought about a Hollywood image of artificial intelligence. And this is really normal because Hollywood has an enormous influence on our subconscious. The default that we think of uh, when we think about artificial intelligence is often a Hollywood image because stories in Hollywood are so well told, right? They're really, they're really sticky inside our brains. Uh, but it's really important to keep in mind that this is not real, that it's totally imaginary, that the Hollywood images are merely fantasies. In fact, what AI is, is it's a branch of computer science. Um, so we've probably got a bunch of academics in the room, so uh, you're probably used to thinking about things in terms of academic disciplines. So in the discipline of computer science, AI is one of the subfields, uh, just like algebra is a subfield of mathematics. 
And inside the subfield of artificial intelligence, we have other subfields like natural language processing or expert systems or machine learning or neural nets. And those are, uh, those are all various subfields. And the one that's most popular right now is the one called machine learning. So this really interesting thing has happened linguistically where people use the terms machine learning and artificial intelligence interchangeably. And it's really important to, uh, to understand that this is happening and to kind of be aware when this linguistic slippage happens. So machine learning, another really good way of describing it is that it's com computational statistics on steroids. And it sounds like there's a little brain inside the computer, right? Even to the most educated people, machine learning evokes the idea that there's like a little, you know, person somewhere in here. Uh, but there is not. It's just a dumb machine, right? And the math that's going on inside this machine, the things that are being computed are beautiful are a remarkable, remarkable human achievement, but the machine is not sentient. It has no soul. It's never going to have one. And so the idea that AI is a salvation, or the idea that AI is going to take over, or the idea that now that we have AI, we have XYZ, is a cultural fantasy, is an idea that uh, that many of us have bought into. And when I was writing the book, I started thinking about this idea and I started wondering where it came from. And I noticed that our fantasies about what AI can do are wrapped up in a lot of other fantasies about, uh, about the future. And I noticed that these fantasies all have a couple of things in common. And one of the things that the fantasy of, uh, one of the things that's ubiquitous in the fantasies about AI is the notion that making a decision via computer is better than making a decision via humans, for example. We have this notion that making a decision by computer is better or more objective or more fair because it's happening inside the machine. And I started to critique this notion and I realized that the idea that a technological solution would be superior to a human solution is something that I call techno chauvinism. Right? So techno chauvinism is the idea that technology is superior. And what we're doing when we're saying a techno chauvinist idea is we're actually saying that technology is better than people, which is really about saying math is better than people because what a computer is doing is it's doing math. It's turning real life into math, which is a marvelous trick. And then I wondered who are the people who are saying that math is better than people? And I realized that our ideas about technology and society actually come from a very small and homogeneous group of people. So let's take a look at some of, the, uh, some of the folks who have given us our ideas about technology and society. So all the way on the left, we have Claude Shannon, who's the father of information theory. We have next to him, Alan Turing. All right, we all know who Aaron, Alan Turing is. Uh, with, the, uh, with the wacky hand, we have Marvin Minsky, widely considered the father of artificial intelligence. Next to him, we have John von Neumann, who designed the three-tiered computer architecture that is inside, that the hardware architecture that is inside every computer you've ever used. And then down at the bottom, we have Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who are the founders of Google. So what do these folks all have in common? They're all white dudes, okay? Uh, anybody know anything about their educational background or their disciplines? They're mathematicians, all right? They're white male mathematicians. Now, there's nothing wrong with white male mathematicians. And some of my best friends are white male mathematicians. All right, but when you have a really homogeneous group of people, the problem is that people embed their own biases in technology. And they can't see them, 
they can't see these biases because often the biases are unconscious. Right, so uh, in mathematics, this was, this is, it remains a particularly big problem. Uh, there's a, an interview in this week's New Yorker, it's a Q&A uh, with a mathematician who won a very prestigious mathematics medal, I believe it was the Abel, uh, the Abel Prize, and she's the first woman to read it, to win it. And I realized that it's 2019, and the discipline of mathematics has been around for centuries. And this prize has been going on for a really long time. And in 2019, the first woman won it. All right, so that should give us pause. Another, uh, another thing that's going on in mathematics at Harvard is that it took until 2018 for Harvard to get senior faculty members who are women in the math department. Okay, so at the time I wrote the book, Harvard had zero senior faculty members who were women in the math department, and now they have two. Okay, so there's, there's a lot going on inside math around structural discrimination, and it's camouflaged in these ideas about genius and who gets counted as a genius. And in general, this, the stereotype or the unconscious bias uh, is that men are mathematicians and women are not, right? So this kind of bias has been playing out in the field for a long time, and it matters that this is happening in math because the early computer scientists were all mathematicians, okay? Because we didn't have computers before 1950-something. We only had mathematicians and physicists and all the other wonderful disciplines that we had. So the field of technology that we see today, the field of computer science, has inherited many of the biases of their predecessors. So how does this bias play out? And why might we need to examine it before we blindly accept that technology is superior? Right? Let's take a look at some examples. Uh, here's an example of a bias in word embeddings. So word embedding is uh, one of the mathematical techniques that is behind Google search. Uh, so what you do in word embedding is you figure out what terms are associated with each other. And so things that are associated with she, with women, with occupations are homemaker, librarian, nanny, housekeeper, nurse, socialite. And terms that are associated with men and occupations, maestro, philosopher, financier, magician, warrior, architect, boss. All right, so these are the sub, the, this is subconscious, Right, And this is what we're feeding into our machine learning models. And I would argue that this is not superior. All right, It's just replicating the sins of the world as it is. Another example of the way that unconscious bias plays out is in uh, the case of the racist soap dispenser. Okay, so soap dispensers. Uh, this is a really quick, this is a great video. I'm gonna skip it for the sake of time. Uh, but what happens is a white man with light skin passes his hand under the soap dispenser and it works. And then a man with darker skin puts his hand under the soap dispenser and it doesn't work. And you might say, oh, well maybe the soap dispenser just broke. Well, the man with dark skin takes a white paper towel, puts it under the soap dispenser and it works. And then he puts his hand under again and it doesn't work. Okay, so the soap dispenser does not recognize somebody with darker skin. And I mean, that's ridiculous. Like it's ridiculous, it's racist, it should not be there, but it is. And these are the kinds of things that are perpetuated over and over and over in computational systems. And so the people who are telling us that, oh, you should just trust us, oh, the computational systems are better, are not really taking into account these kinds of biases, in part because they have their own unconscious 
biases. So another, uh, another couple of, I'm just gonna skip, uh, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. And I want us to keep in mind that algorithmic systems discriminate by default. So when we feed algorithmic systems with data about the world as it is, what they do is they replicate the world as it is. And we live in a world that has racism, that has structural discrimination. We have not yet achieved a world that is free of these things. So when we're just feeding algorithmic systems with this data, all they're learning to do is replicate it. So all of this existing inequality gets embedded in the systems, gets magnified, it becomes hard to see, and it becomes impossible to erase. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, let me start by thanking Mona for putting this together. It's a very, very nice occasion. I actually graduated from NYU. Uh, I had my PhD here a couple of years ago, and I spent a lot of my time at IPK, actually, but I haven't been back to visit in quite some time, so it's really wonderful to be here again. Thank you for having me. Um, I hope I can make a habit of this, actually. Um, I'm really pleased to also be here with my friends and colleagues and to follow uh, what a wonderful introductory talk here uh, by Meredith. So I thought I would do something a little cheeky. Uh, and I was sort of playing with the title of this series, um, Co-opting AI. Um, and of course, I had this, it turns out, correct intuition that what Moana had in mind was the idea that we would sort of reclaim the way we tell stories about AI. But I actually thought about uh, sort of flipping this, which is sort of how AI co-ops. Um, and uh, to kind of build on what Meredith was saying, um, the kind of state of the art here, the thing that people often are pointing to when they speak about AI these days is machine learning. And the way of understanding machine learning is sort of teaching the computer how to do something by example, by showing it many examples. So rather than having to sort of sit down and write rules to instruct a computer how to perform complex tasks like understanding language or interpreting human voices or even identifying what's in a photo, what we can do in instead is sort of use these pattern recognition algorithms, which we then expose to literally billions of examples of the kind of thing we wanted to be able to identify, for instance. Um, and we have the computer all on its own, sort of identify the distinguishing characteristics of the things that we wanted to identify. And given that Finn is here, I thought I would use the canonical example, which is spam, actually. <laughs> so um, when I say you know, AI co-opting the world, what I can think about is something like spam. So maybe you don't really realize this, but when you click on, uh, when you have a piece of spam in your inbox and you tell your web provider this is a piece of spam, right? How many people have this experience of like, like actually telling it, oh, you missed this one message. This is actually spam, right? So, you know, this is actually performing a function you might not fully realize, Ian, which is that what we're doing in that case is something called labeling. We are telling, and let's use Google, right? Gmail. We are telling Gmail, this is an example of spam. And every day, billions of people are telling Google, here is an example of spam. This is a question. Yes, so there's also the possibility of getting things wrong, which maybe I'll get to. Oh, that's also great. So you can also teach it when it gets it wrong. Very nice, yes, great. And what's really important here is that there's all this human activity, which is somehow being co-opted in the sense that it's being channeled into the service uh, that Google provides. So human labor has gone into the process of producing these examples of spam, labeled examples of spam, which are essential to the development of models of algorithms that can then identify spam all on its own. 
right? So it's sort of an interesting example of the general model at work here that we're taking human activity, we're using that often as an example from which to learn, and that is the basis upon which we can then generate these techniques for automating all sorts of previously intractable problems. And so another example, which people might be familiar with, is, is the CAPTCHA. I don't know if this is the thing where you have to like, identify. Increasingly, it's pretty clear that what we're doing is we're helping Google tr like, train its models for self-driving cars, because all the things they ask us are like, identify the stop sign, identify the bicyclist, identify the car. Uh, you know, this was an interesting, this is a reverse Turing test. It's supposed to prove your humanity. You're not a, you know, you're not a bot. But in the process, it serves a secondary function of providing all these examples. And again, what we're able to then do is sort of co-opt the human work uh, that you're doing to prove your humanity into the service of developing these new models. And this goes, this goes on and on, right? So you can think of it also in uh, language translation. So, um, you know, how do we actually figure out how to train machines to be able to translate between different languages? Well, it turns out you want extremely high quality documents where there has been expert translations across multiple, uh, across, uh, you know, for, for one specific document. And where might you find such um, multiple versions of the same document in different languages? Well, the United Nations has such documents. And so a lot of language translation historically has been based on repurposing these high quality translations between different languages to train a machine to be able to do this automatically. Um, and this is also what we have in things like uh, the workplace, right? So when we think about how AI might change labor, you have to understand that what we're really doing is we're teaching the machine how to replace us, right? We're actually demonstrating through our own actions how it is that you're able to perform some task. And so in many situations, often without much re realization, uh, the work that we are doing is being co-opted in some sense by the companies that are able to then use that to train the model to pr perform the job uh, that you once did. Right? And so I thought this was a kind of interesting way of thinking about uh, co-opting, not in the sense that we're reclaiming the narrative, but instead that sort of machine learning is a co-opting machine, right? That by definition, kind of constitutionally, we can think of it in those terms. And as Meredith nicely laid out, um, if this process is fundamentally about learning from example, of trying to draw general lessons from the particular examples we show the machine, um, then we have to think very carefully about the examples that we set, that we are using to train these models. Um, and to the extent that this is actually human culture, human decisions, uh, human frailties, the machine is going to learn those things as well. Right? So that can be from uh, things as straightforward as trying to train a machine to evaluate employees where the examples that we're using to train the model are past subjective decisions about whether or not someone is qualified or the subjective assessment of that person's performance in the job. Those are the examples we're using to train what is going to be purported to be an objective assessment, right? But really what we're doing is we're inheriting the subjective decisions that we're using to train the model, right? The same thing also holds uh, in language in a very nice way that, that uh, Meredith pointed out, right? So, these, ling these word embeddings are a way to sort of teach a machine to understand language by looking at how words co-occur in large corpora of text. Um, and actually, standard way of training one of these word embeddings is actually to use the common crawl, which is a data set that Google has put together. Um, and what this means is that the way we are teaching machines to learn to understand human language is by having it read the internet, right? Think about that, like our word embeddings are a way of understanding language based on the way people have used language on the internet. This is really important, and this is true of, I mean, people use Reddit as well, there's many other data sets, but think about that, right? This is not some kind of pure, traditional way of thinking about linguistics. This is actually saying, idiomatically, how is language used? We're gonna learn a very flexible representation of how language is used, but how language is used is obviously not gonna be in the ways we necessarily want it to be used, right? I mean, it could be in the sense that like maybe historically, these kind of associations were true, and that's reflected in the text we use to train the machine. But it can also be true in much more uh, subtle ways in which, you know, offensive associations, not things that are even related to historical differences in occupation by gender, for instance. Um, and so I think ultimately, uh, we have to be very sensitive to the fact that if AI or machine learning is a kind of co-opting machine, it is going to co-opt the same kinds of problems that we have with human culture and human decision making. Um, so, for the past few years, I've been involved in this kind of budding community, somewhat interdisciplinary community of people who are trying to point out this problem, sort of specify technically when it is 
uh, when it's the case that these machines are learning these kinds of biases, and secondarily, to try to figure out if you can intervene in some way. So here, it's uh, taking inspiration from some of the thinking in discrimination law. So we have a kind of convenient definition of unfairness in discrimination law in the sense that there's a so-called four-fifths rule. This comes from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the federal employment regulator. And this is a standard uh, that suggests that when decisions are made, at least in this case with respect to employment, which result in a disparity in the hiring rate greater than 20% between, for instance, men or women, uh, on its face, that constitutes what they call a disparate impact, and that could be enough to bring a lawsuit. Uh, this was actually, maybe somewhat unsurprisingly, a very attractive place to start uh, for computer scientists who are trying to think about questions of fairness, because it's a mathematical definition of fairness. Right? Um, and so in the kind of subsequent years, you know, I'd say like past eight years or so, uh, there's been a lot of work to try to take these kind of mathematical definitions of fairness and use them as a way to evaluate the models that we are building, right? So if I train a model to evaluate job applicants, if I train a model to try to uh, figure out how to drive cars, you know, can we evaluate how it's going to make decisions with respect to different types of candidates? Right? Um, and it's been an interesting experience in the sense that this you could also think of as a, a different type of co-opting, trying to use machine learning as a way to explicitly advance uh, interests around civil rights and social justice, right? So I think of this as a different type of co-opting where we can actually seize upon these tools, uh, not just as a way to replicate, as Meredith said, uh, the problems with human decision making or human culture, but instead to sort of be more intentional and interventionist in the world. Um, and so it's been an interesting experience to see computer science after, I don't know, three decades of outside critics trying to argue that there needs to be more attention to values in design to actually see some of this now finally being taken up. And so there's actually quite a lot of technical work now that is trying to advance normative values purposefully, explicitly. Um, and interestingly enough, in part maybe because it's being done largely by computer scientists, this has had practical impact in the sense that industry and to some extent government is actually quite interested in this. This is something that's obviously in the news very often, and so there's quite a bit of pressure on industry to do something about it. Um, but it also is tractable in the sense that maybe kind of vague concerns around discrimination or bias might not have been in the past. And so companies have kind of seized on this work uh, in fairness and machine learning in a way that is it also, I would call, a third type of co-opting, right? Where the work that had been done by, I think, kind of socially conscious computer scientists that was really meant to be empowering and, you know, something that was working in the service of traditional civil rights goals suddenly becomes something that fits quite nicely, potentially, with the existing interests of companies, right? So in particular, something that people have begun to point out is that if the main concern that you have is that some of these systems don't work as well for certain populations, as we kind of maybe got to see a little slide of in Meredith's uh, slide deck, um, if it turns out that our models are less likely to accurately assess, for instance, female applicants, um, well, one possible response to that is to then go and collect more information about that population so that the accuracy of your model can be improved. And in the end, this is actually potentially a very attractive problem for industry in the sense that it justifies investing more in data collection and, and sort of seeing the problem of fairness or bias as one that's overcome by simply maximizing accuracy, which would have been its concern all along, right? And so it's been quite interesting to see some of this critical work that's been done in computer science quickly sort of churned into something that is much more aligned potentially with the traditional concerns of industry and government, not something that is seen as uh, fundamentally challenging, but actually perfectly in line with existing goals. And so I worry very much, in fact, about the co-opting of the work on fairness and machine learning, that it's no longer necessarily serving the critical interest it maybe had in its inception, and now increasingly something that can be redeployed to sort of whitewash or paper over what continues to be a very problematic set of institutions. So I'll stop there. Hi, everybody. 
<clears throat> excuse, you'll have to excuse me. Between a guest lecture and my normal schedule, I've ended up teaching seven hours today before <laughs> this again. So my voice is almost gone, and uh, and I'm I'm falling back into like weird ancient sentence structure. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I, thank you so much to IPK for having me. This is such a marvelous series um, and such an interesting event. Um, and uh, I'm really delighted to be presenting with Meredith and Solon, um, who have already addressed so many of the questions that surround the issues of, of co-opting AI that I feel at liberty to be a little irresponsible. Um, so... <clears throat> Um, and I also just have to mention in terms of training data and like its bad uses, as Solon mentioned, um, spam has a really interesting history in this regard. But one of the key corpora that were used for a lot of natural language processing and spam filtering applications, like learning material from text, were all the emails that were part of the Enron deposition. So all of the internal emails to the Enron Corporation, which are like a fantastic archive of off-the-cuff emailing, except they're also a model of the use of text and email that is specific specific to like the Houston energy trading scene and also just like absolute shit bags, you know, just like <laughs> terrible human beings um, who end up setting like the linguistic tone and framework for us. So <clears throat> um, with, with that very bleak starting point, um, I'm going to make my screen brighter. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, what I'd like to bring to the table tonight after these, uh, both of these talks um, are some thoughts about AI and the future. And not, to be clear, the actual future of AI. Budgets, agendas, hardware and code, training sets, relative success and provisional failure and social consequences. All those things are actual future. Because AI has always only partially been about the actual future of probable developments and base rate outcomes, it has also been singularly productive of philosophical speculation, fantasy, and arguments about ourselves and the future as such. In the lexicon of science fiction writing workshops, which are a really interesting experience and filled with their own terms of art, AMFM refers not to radio, but to how you describe speculative technologies. Are you writing about actual machines or are you writing about fucking magic? It's a crass but very memorable way of distinguishing between technologies in all their friction, faults, inefficiencies, kludges, and adaptations, and our fantasies about them. We've been discussing actual machines and actual consequences. I'm here to talk about the fucking magic. Um, which Meredith has already brought up in a number of ways at the sort of uh, at the beginning of her talk. Um, and fucking magic is something to which AI is very prone, offering, as it does, a perfect container for our own anxieties about consciousness, intelligence, control, and agency. We could go centuries earlier, but I'd like to start in 1914, in Paris at the Sorbonne, when the engineer and inventor Leonardo Torres y Quevedo debuted El Ajedrecista, the first real chess-playing automaton, which could play and win within the extremely constrained limits of a king, rook, king, end game. Um, so basically, like this is a minimally, minimally complex chess game, but nonetheless, one in which the machine could reliably win by simply cutting off avenues of escape until you uh, lost. Um, however, however, let me read you this uh, um, headline from reporting about this automaton. He would substitute machinery for the human mind, trumpeted the headline in Scientific American, from which I quote this splendid sentence. There is, of course, no claim that it will think or accomplish things where thought is necessary, but its inventor claims that the limits within which thought is really necessary need to be better defined, and that the automaton can do many things that are properly classed with thought. In other words, this is a debate that we have been having almost unchanged for more than a century since. Whether we've been talking about chess, about facial and image recognition, about neural networks, about spatial navigation, you name it. The argument over whether or not something thinks, what things should be classified with thought, what we mean by thought, and so on. So, and I love that you put up that gallery because a bunch of these people turn up in my talk. So we have some previous points of reference. In the early 1950s, Alan Turing, previous appearance, <clears throat> published On Computing Machinery and Intelligence, which presents the now famous imitation game or Turing test for artificial intelligence. But this bracingly contemptuous paper is much more about why we humans think our minds are so special in the first place and how that colors our evaluations of other kinds of minds. 
As he points out in an argument about whether a computer program could surprise us, it is perhaps worth remarking that the appreciation of something as surprising requires as much of a creative mental act whether the surprising event originates from a person, a book, a machine, or anything else. That is, how we describe things as artificial intelligence and respond to the things we identify as such has much more to do with us, with our creative mental acts, than with it, whatever it might be. Through many, creative, through many creative mental acts on our part, the actual machines of AI are constantly being conscripted into the business of fucking magic. I'd like to talk briefly about the grandest edifice of the FM side of AI, the native 20th and 21st century computational theology and mythos of the singularity. A notional moment when powerful general purpose AI can improve itself in a self-augmenting cycle leading to an exponential runaway explosion in intelligence and the end of the human condition as we know it, whether in our annihilation or transfiguration. The term originates in a conversation between John von Neumann, previous appearance, um, <clears throat> and Stanislaw Ulam in the 1950s, where von Neumann meant it more in the sense of the pace of technological innovation outstripping our ability to comprehend and cope. It was given specificity by the mathematician and sci-fi writer Werner Vinge in a presentation for an invited NASA workshop in 1993, where he reframed it as the imminent creation by technology of entities with greater than human intelligence. And also foresaw it as a disaster, right? The subtitle for his paper for NASA was How to Survive the Coming Post-Human Era. This is not a positive thing. And then popularized and dramatically altered by Ray Kurzweil who pivoted a career in computer science and software development into his current gig of prophesying a coming epoch of immortal disembodied intelligence, which will torch through all our seemingly intractable human problems like coherent light. Or, as Nick Bostrom and others argue, it is an existential risk to humanity and perhaps all life on Earth. And, as still others argue and speculate, the singularity has already taken place, and we are currently living in a simulation of our universe, being run on some shard of our prospective post-human intelligence, or that of another class of entities who have followed the logically inevitable path to maximizing the intelligence produced per watt of energy in the universe. The idea is taken with sufficient seriousness in corners of Silicon Valley that institutes and scientists have been hired to figure out how we might determine if we are in fact already living in a simulated reality. The fact that that's happening is like the greatest argument for a stronger capital gains tax that I could imagine. <laughs> <clears throat> The group I'm personally most interested in, a nonprofit called the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, are trying to reason their way through a prospective post-human intelligence to figure out how it could be made most friendly to us, which is at once oddly reasonable and perhaps one of the strangest jobs in the history of logic. This project coexists with the argument, increasingly powerful, in Valley Philanthropy, that we should be putting more money into AI research and development than anything else, on the grounds that, well, do you want to save paltry tens or hundreds of thousands of human lives now? Or seed the development of post-human trillions of minds expanding through the solar system? No need to worry about quotidian matters like clean drinking water or pesticide use then. I would like, to, I would like us to take these examples, and there are many, many more, as a chance to think about how AI as an industry and as an area of social consequence functions at a peculiar intersection of AM and FM. We misattribute agency and autonomy, and thereby blame and responsibility, to systems that are merely very complex and made by people, in points that have already been very well made by the previous speakers. And we paper over flaws, bias, unfairness, and plain bad design with the magical salve of intelligence, which is an effectively meaningless quantitative term, but is constantly being described as though it were like heat or mass, something that we could easily and coherently measure. We undervalue some of the truly surprising results of AI research and our desire for theology by other means. AI, especially in popular culture, is often a place for dialogue with ourselves about what the future means, sometimes at the expense of understanding the present. Norbert Wiener, the cyberneticist, who actually played chess against a replica of El Aje Dresista in the 1950s, um, and I just can't resist mentioning when I was looking into the weird history of um, the chess playing automaton, while he was in Paris playing chess over and over against a machine, his chaperone was Benoit Mandelbro, and I would have loved to have eavesdropped on whatever conversations the two of them had as they were wandering around. Um, 
Norbert Wiener, often compared the threat of AI in terms of automation and Cold War military strategy to the golem and the sorcerer's apprentice and the monkey's paw, magical objects whose execution of poorly specified desires with unlimited power leads to disaster. I would suggest a way to think about the mythic properties of current AI is the doppelganger, the sinister reflection embodying our fears about ourselves in which we can see our own anxieties, desires, and unspoken biases reflected. The truly human part of artificial intelligence is that we can't resist making it all about us. Thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna start with a few questions and then we're gonna open to the floor. Um, yep, please, please use the mic. Okay, thank you so much to our panel. This was fantastic and it also sort of really worked well together. So thank you enormously. Um, my first question is for Meredith. Do we all need to learn how to code? Oh God, no. <laughs> uh, so, there is a lot of rhetoric about, out there about, oh, everybody should learn to code. I, I think that we need to understand code and we need to kind of understand the basic processes. Um, but in the same way that you don't entirely need to know how your car works in order to drive, you don't necessarily need to learn to code in order to operate a computer, but at the same time, you're a better driver if you understand how your car works because then you're better about maintenance and you know you don't grind the gears or, I don't know, do bad things to your car. Uh, like forget to change the oil for five years. You know? um, so I don't think everybody needs to learn to code, but I do care very deeply about computational literacy and about empowerment. I think that one of the ways that uh, gatekeeping has operated in computer science is that people have been made to feel small or to feel less because they don't have the same kind of specialized knowledge as the, uh, as the fancy insider computer scientists. And so uh, gatekeeping, happens and I, I don't think that's productive. I don't think it's kind. I, I am an advocate for more inclusive technology and also for uh, explaining technology better so that people can be included. Thank you. My next question is for Solon. I know you're a social scientist working a lot with computer scientists and I wonder based on your talk and sort of the work that I know you produce, how do you engage sort of in conversations with mathematicians and computer scientists? And specifically, how do you think about translating sort of qualitative ways of knowing the world into quantitative ways of knowing the world and vice versa? And what are sort of the kinds of issues that pop up, but also the kind of surprising moments? <laughs> this is a great question. Um, I mean, the, the truthful answer was like 10 years of failure. <laughs> um, I was like, I was naive about um, how much uh, people would tolerate like an ignorant person asking questions. Um, I mean, actually, speaking about IPK, like I spent time here with people who were um, ethnographers who sort of like taught me the, in, like this, perhaps well understood strategy of like, if you're very interested in a topic and you can evince your interest so clearly, but also at the same time reveal your ignorance, people actually want to tell you things. <laughs> um, so I spent many, many years doing this and had a kind of accidental education in a lot of this computational work, um, but it was, not linear and I have huge gaps still. Um, but, you know, I think to merit this point, like I think ultimately my ability to engage with some of these colleagues um, did require at some point learning some fundamentals, some basics. Um, and that 
you know, like what is required to get to that level, I think is far less than people think. Uh, I've kind of made a career, I would say, on having a marginally better understanding about some of these technical things than most other people. But it was only because I was stupid enough to kind of continue to pound my head against the, you know, <laughs> the, the, the door. But um, at this point, I think that's not really the same challenge. I feel like the field has moved enough. There's a lot of work that's being done that helps bring this to a broader audience. Um, it's actually very encouraging to see there be like sufficient fluency in some of these technical aspects that it's impossible for technical people not to take seriously non-technical people, right? Like they understand the techno technical stuff well enough now that their criticisms really have quite a bit of force. Um, and in the opposite direction, you know, I think the real risk I was mentioning is that um, <laughs> computer science might have this kind of reaction that says, okay, that's great. I finally understand what you're trying to tell me. I'm going to go off and handle this. <laughs> I'll see you later. Like, thanks very much. I can, I can take care of this now. Um, and I think there's a real risk that unless um, there's a sort of like more respectful engagement about the different ways of knowing and studying uh, on both sides, actually, that it's extremely easy for computer science to sort of be imperialistic and say, we're going to go off and take care of this on our own. And likewise, for the kind of non-computer science community to just sort of adopt a very adversarial critical posture, which sort of treats, peop treats people who are largely uh, from an engineering background as being like, you know, disingenuous or fundamentally stupid or lacking any kind of conception of the subtleties of the social world. Um, and I think ultimately what I've tried to advocate when I speak to both, both communities, not that this is a coherent set of communities, but it's just kind of modesty, you know, like none of us actually know very much. Uh, and it would be very, very, it would be much more productive if we actually recognize that what we're able to achieve is quite modest. Uh, and generally people tend to find that a little bit more inviting. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Finn, you spoke a little about intelligence and sort of the different notions of intelligence and about hubris of the of humans on the planet and i sort of it really got me thinking about hubris generally and sort of what what counts as intelligence do you feel that with the ai narrative that's going around right now it is a is a moment to reevaluate what we mean by intelligence and i'm thinking about sort of the animal kingdom and sort of different kinds of intelligence is potential, potentially knowledges, or do you think it's just going to go on and we're going to sort of keep picturing ourselves sort of on top of the, <laughs> the pyramid? That's a fantastic question. Um, the short answer is, oh God, I hope not. I mean, to that like constantly. No, I think, I think one of the most interesting um, and sort of thrilling aspects of the history and legacies of AI research for the many different kinds of, of particular subfields that are within AI are the ways in which they are um, they are decentering our own sense of like what we think our self-reflective intelligence is, what we think is happening when we introspect. Um, and in particular, what I think is an absolutely frustrating and pernicious fiction, which nonetheless persists, which is that we are reasonable creatures, that we are somehow like being logical all the time and that we should be able to rationalize our you know, we should a we should discount our emotions and our affective experience, and b we should have some narrow subcategory of human cognition which qualifies as rational, which is like reasonable and realistic. Um, and when you look at the the kinds of both, like obviously this is a, a, a two sort of there's there's many different components that feed into this including areas in cognitive science that are that are enormously interesting but it's been really extraordinary to see how much progress has been made in diverse areas of ai once people abandon the idea that it has to work in the way that we imagine that our minds work um, so increasingly just as a mental exercise for myself as someone who's very interested in the history of this um, i have been really enjoying whenever i read about any kind of specific ai project trying not to picture like you know a person in a computer you know, like a, a head in a box but to instead picture a slime mold because i think in many ways like if we're t depending on what we're talking about many of these kinds of research 
actually have more in common with the way that quorum sensing and slime molds works, which is actually an enormously sophisticated reasoning process that's taking place through this. Anyway, I won't go into my whole slime mold Wait, thing. Wait, hang on. Slime molds uh, have quorum sensing? Yes. Slime they molds. know that there are other slime molds around? Slime molds have an extremely rich way of figuring out what they are on and what they're connected with and what to separate themselves from. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So when we start to think about the kinds of reasoning that are taking place, reasoning is a very big word here, but when we start to see... Um, the, the effectiveness of many other kinds of minds. Um, I hope that this is not going to lead to some kind of anxiety about like the dehumanization, you know, the loss of our sense of ourselves as people, but instead a recognition of the fact that we have always been far more cognitively blurry and complex than I think the, the inherited version of cognition and reason that is in place in AI would have us believe. Um, and I would love it if this could spur, if, if something that has started out as being unpleasant and dehumanizing, like dealing with recaptchas, you know, like that constant challenge of like, hey, are you a crude software program or not? Identify these school buses, you know, um, that what starts out as being unsettling and decentering about that, there's actually something that I think could be quite profound and worth celebrating in there, which is a recognition that we have always been deeply, um, uh, we've always been very unusual creatures in the way in which we inhabit our environment and make sense of it. And likewise, that we are in a world that is filled with many other kinds of minds that are inhabiting the world and making sense of it in enormously rich and complex ways. And that AI can join the ranks of that rather than what it initially seemed to be doing culturally, which was reifying an idea of a very specific kind of logical reasoning process as the end all be all of cognition. Sorry, that got kind of ranty. <laughs> it's a good question. Great. We're going to open the floor to questions. We have a. Yeah. You know what? While we're while we're looking for uh, the first question, I just want to say that uh, you were uh, that what you, when you spoke about the kind of wacky ideas of the early AI folks, yeah. um, it. Uh, it reminded me of uh, one of the things about the singularity worshippers that I think is so interesting, which is that they think that uh, if you keep your brain in a meat locker, <laughs> in, they have this meat locker in Arizona where when you die, they cryogenically preserve your brain, and they're trying to keep them uh, frozen so the brains can be uploaded into some future consciousness. Yeah. And... You know, and there's also all kinds of other stuff, weird stuff, like they want to talk to aliens and they like are taking infusions of teenage blood. And like when when we just hit that level of weirdness, like it's really hard to take that vision of the future seriously. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and to your point, forgive me, I just want to make one, because I've actually been to Scottsdale. Um, where you have they have been yeah, to the well, meat locker with a, the brains? A bunch of key people who are in the book that I've been working on who have passed away, their heads are all in the same doer. Like they're all like wrapped in tinfoil, like baked potatoes in this big like cryogenic oh chamber. Is Marvin um, Minsky there? Uh, no, 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 he's, he's um, I don't know where he is actually. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, but. The, um, but but part of the one of the things that that raises, which I think is such a significant point, that also speaks to this, is that um, is the whole focus on keeping the head right, the neuro procedure. When we now know that we have an enormous portion of like the whole body's nervous system is based in the gut, we know that we actually have like we have we understand very little about how our consciousness functions outside of the context of being in the bodies that we're in, and so the the premise that you somehow consist of your experience of like riding around behind your eyes, you know, in the chamber of your head is such a basic philosophical, but also like empirical error to make that you would then devote yourself to the idea that if you somehow just rescued your brain, you would be rescuing everything significant about you. Um, there's, there's just, I think that really speaks to the idea that I think that's actually been a block to a lot of potential breakthroughs. Not just the fact that, though you're absolutely right, that level of futurity is totally way out there <laughs> and bizarre, but also the fact that it, again, is still so premised on the idea of like, this is how I feel I am smart. 
I feel like this is the way in which I encounter myself as smart. If I can somehow, you know, like run that on a carbon, like on a silicon substrate instead of carbon, then I will be smarter forever. Well, and we also see that in the notion that uh, smart people play chess. Like for yes. a very long time, like the measure of intelligence for a, hum for a computer was, can we get a computer to play chess and can we get a computer to beat a human at chess? And remember when the first computer beat a human at chess, it was like this big breakthrough. And then when the computer beat the human at Go, it was another big breakthrough. But to me, it's really interesting that the marker of intelligence is being good at playing chess which is because the people who constructed the problem, who constructed the whole field of AI, thought that playing chess made you smart because they really liked playing chess and they thought they were smart. Sorry, just quickly before we, um, that is very interesting because when we think about today, like the legacy of that today until this day, one of the most powerful artificial intelligence companies, <coughs> DeepMind owned by Google, owned by Alphabet, um, and the whole goal story, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Sort of the, the advancement of what we call very advanced artificial intelligence still happens within the realm of these strategic games. And so I do wonder if we take that and think about that sort of in, in, in sociological terms or social terms. Okay, so, but when we take it out of context and deploy it in the real world, what are sort of, what's, what, where do, would we need an, an agent that plays strategically and wins against an opponent? And to me, that's war, for example. That's, a, that's, that's an application. Um, and so, so there is, there's consequences that are not, I feel, that are not spelled out um, to that. And I wonder if you could respond to that sort of what's the knock-on effect that we don't talk about right now but that might happen eventually. Yeah. You're right. So, yeah. sure. so there's um, what we've talked today about mostly, well, I guess Finn went. Is what's called supervised machine learning. Um, supervised here means that a human is labeling the examples. Humans are saying this is an example of spam. Um, another area of artificial intelligence is called reinforcement learning. Um, this is slightly different, uh, and this is actually what's often used in games. Um, generally, at a high level, it's what they would call an agent. This is sort of like a program uh, that has a number of options it can choose from, um, you know, ch moves on a board, um, and you allow this agent to sort of make autonomous choices uh, and then sort of observe how the state of the world changes based on its choices, and it continues to play. Um, and so this is slightly different from supervised machine learning in the sense that it's experimenting on its own. It's saying, if I do this, what happens? If I do this, what happens? Um, and that has been, I've discovered, the driver of actually most of the anxiety around uh, AI apocalypse. It's not supervised machine learning that people worry about. It's that a very powerful agent can experiment in ways that are maximizing some long-term goal, but its way of maximizing it, it has discovered is by like, yes, turning the world uh, into paper clips or yeah. these examples, right? Um, but it's very interesting. So the supervised, sorry, reinforcement learning as a technique really only makes sense when like the set of choices confronting the agent are well specified uh, and they can kind of exhaustively explore the space, meaning all the set of options. And so unsurprisingly, where this is applied is games, right? Where like the set of actions is predetermined and you just allow it to try out all these different things. And so uh, Go was a kind of interesting success story of combining supervised machine learning, learning from other players' success in Go, and then also using reinforcement learning to allow the machine to sort of experiment on its own to discover new strategies. Um, and it's very interesting that like most of the breakthroughs in reinforcement learning, which get a lot of attention, are video games, right? Like not chess, but like Atari games and increasingly even like Nintendo games and maybe Super Nintendo, you know, <laughs> like slowly going through the 80s into the 90s. Uh, but these are extremely constrained environments and it's really hard to see how this will necessarily translate into the world except for robotics, right? So this is where like, people actually are genuinely interested in reinforcement learning where they think if we put a physical artifact in the world that can experiment, what will it be able to learn? And there's actually some like pretty crazy stuff happening in that area. Um, 
But just you have to imagine like this only makes sense in a world where you think everything can be discretized into a fixed set of choices that actually capture the full range of possibilities. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. First question. Hi. Uh, thank you all. This was awesome. Uh, I have two questions, uh, if that's okay. Um, the first draws on the last part of Solon's talk, but I assume maybe all three of you would have uh, uh, something to say on that. Uh, basically, I found really interesting like the process you described in, in what you call like the third type of co-opting, where it, in which, as I under, if I understood, we have these companies kind of co-opting previous work on uh, uh, fairness and bias in order to mine more data and therefore become more accurate, which is what they wanted all along. And that's, that just made me think of basically, maybe it's possible to say that going against past bias and past discrimination almost inherently means making prediction of suggestions that are less than optimal in terms of accuracy, right? And in that sense, we can say that co-opting AI may be in the sense that, like you suggested, the title of the series is hoping for is somehow going against the very essence of artificial intelligence, right? And is that something that we can think through or really find ways conceptually to uh, uh, um, co-opt AI in a good way, right? And the second question is, I'm just wondering whether you also might think that um, the apparent aversion to ascribe agency to an AI may be counterproductive sometimes. And what I mean by that is, um, obviously I agree with uh, 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 everything you said, but when we talk about the complexity of AI systems and decision-making systems, it's not just that the data is biased, it's also that the operations become so complex to the point where we can't really pick up on the correlations, right? And we lose track of the actual decision-making process. And I'm wondering if we can call that or describe that as some sort of agency where an algorithm, even though it's statistical, is making decisions in a way we can't understand and we follow their, these decisions. So in a sense, it maybe does have agency. And I think the danger of ignoring that is just focusing on the data and less on transparency or other kinds of auditing. So I'm just wondering what you think. Do you want to take the first since it was sort of... I can do it very quickly. Yeah. yeah, so that's exactly, I think, the challenge we confront now. So um, there's a fair amount of technical work that's being done to try to propose how to embed normative values in technology. Some of those are much more aligned in keeping with like the existing agenda of a lot of the industry, and some are much more critical. I mean, as you say, like you can imagine one way of trying to like debias in the sense of like make predictions that are not just sort of perfectly accurate according to what had traditionally been like the pattern of outcomes is to make different kinds of predictions that are not in a sense accurate, right? Um, and you know, there's sort of questions about whether you can sort of justify that over some like longer time horizon. So like, how do you convince companies that actually it might, might, may, it might make sense to like adopt this definition, which is at least in the near, near term seems like really working at all, a counter purpose to uh, its accuracy goals. Um, but I think what's very dangerous ultimately is that so much of this can kind of just feel like, let's just make this thing work as perfectly as possible for everyone, which is not necessarily the same thing as like achieving some goals of justice or something. Um, and I think it's notable that the definitions or the kind of work that's been taken up are not the more critical ones, not the ones that are sort of like trying to compensate for past injustice. Uh, there are ones that are just sort of like, let's just make sure this is accurate. I think it's also important to differentiate between the popular and the good. So a with the way that a lot of these computational systems work is instead of the system making a decision, they look at what users have voted on, right? So in Hacker News or Reddit, for example, things that have been upvoted a lot are considered the priority and they get shown first, right? So the popular uh, is a replacement for the good. But when we're talking about uh, society in general, we do need to think about the good because there are lots of things in the world that are popular but not good, like racism. Okay. And so, if we, and so mathematically, it's much easier to go with popular than with good because a system can't, like, we see this in social media, in the social media 
disinformation crisis, right? Like if there were a way to computationally determine what is good language, then it would have been done already. But all we have is popular as a proxy and that has backfired. And I'll just say very briefly, I very much take your point about the question of um, of how to how to think about like when and under what circumstances we should attribute agency to things, which is a, which is a matter like not just for of like philosophical semantics, but um, but something that can both be used to um, yeah to like cover up for decisions that humans made in terms of like the training data they chose, how they labeled things, everything that was kind of put into the system under the cover of like well it's just the magic oracle has spoken. However, um, you're absolutely right that one of the really interesting aspects of especially as these systems become more complex, is being able to understand why something came out this particular way. So beyond like it, particularly egregious cases of um, bias or unfairness, there's actually a whole discipline called proof theory that looks at, among other things, um, how you could not just verify that a proof that was arrived at computationally was correct, but also how you would begin to understand how it had arrived at that proof. Like there's some really interesting depths to how we, we think about that. The reason why I'm so particular and fussy about this issue is that um, as, a, as a historian of technology, I have developed a deep distrust for how easily we attribute agency and develop theories of mind about things, both because that can you know, lead to all of the flaws we've already discussed, but also because it can sometimes mean that we actually miss the actual thinking that's going on and the nature of that thinking. There's actually kind of out of left field, but there's a book I'd love to recommend by Stephen Budiansky called If a Lion Could Talk, which is basically a survey of the, um, the history of the theories and the many, many wrong steps that people made in studying the consciousness of other animals largely because they kept trying to figure out how it was like human consciousness, right? Like the sort of recurring theme of being like, I know why the birds are looking at it like that because of this thing, which makes sense to me. And it's ultimately in some ways a tragic book. It's a book about coming to terms with the deep unknowability of much of the world. But in that unknowability, we can actually perceive things much more clearly. Fantastic. We have more questions from the audience. All right, some interesting issues being raised here. I've got several comments, one of which is that mathematics, like physics, doesn't care about humanity per se. We are, a, we are reflections of it, but mathematics and physics doesn't care about solving social problems and social ills and making things fair or good. It is what it is. If you build a bad bridge because you wanted to have a a, a uh, demographically representative team to build it, it's gonna fall down if it's not built well. That said, I would say the greater issue with regards to AI and its construction and the evangelism for its solving of social problems it is, is it is rooted in the uh, what are fundamentally totalitarian as egalitarian creeds that emerge to us from the Abrahamic faiths. Because each of the Abrahamic faiths, but more, more so Judaism and, and uh, Islam than Christianity, have an eschatology. They propose that humankind is on a journey, there's a beginning and an end. Not that it, it's circular, for example, which we see in other religions, like uh, Hinduism. And so the belief that it's going to solve our problems is rooted in this tribalism, rooted in this narcissism, and rooted in this eschatology that's going to deliver us and, and is designed to prioritize and to uh, empower those who are the monitors and the progenitors of these faiths. If you have any comments, you can make them, but that's my observation. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, of explaining. I'm thinking about explaining. Uh, I'm thinking about your comment, I'm thinking about your question, I'm thinking about your comment. And I'm reminded of a time that uh, I was trying to understand recursion, which is a computational concept. This was early on in college. And uh, I went to my professor and I said, I just don't understand this. And he started trying to explain it. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm with you, but like, what 
is the base case. Like, why does it stop? Like, it goes backwards, and then it hits the base case, and then it kind of goes forwards to solve the problem. But, like, why does it do that? And he, he tried to explain it, but then I didn't understand it, and he wasn't explaining it well. And he said, okay, listen, just pretend that it's magic. And, and just trust that it works, and, and it'll allow you to go on with your life and go on and solve this problem. And I was like, okay. Like, a Harvard professor just told me that I need to just believe that it's magic, so okay. I'll believe it's magic. And so I did. I just, I, I said, okay, it works. And then eventually I figured out how it did work. Like, eventually I got to that knowledge that I needed. And eventually I did understand recursion, but I, I, I think a lot about how that was simultaneously a genius move and a total cop out. All right, so it was a failure on the part of my professor to adequately explain something. It was a failure of communication. Uh, at the same time, I didn't have enough knowledge, enough, say, advanced mathematical knowledge to really understand what was going on. And I needed more knowledge before I could understand what he was saying. So I think this happens a lot in explaining what's happening inside uh, machine learning systems. And Solon, you have this amazing explanation of kind of the, uh, the math, like a visual explanation of what's going on inside mathematical models when, uh, or sorry, machine learning models when they're making decisions based on multiple variables. And I actually think about that a lot when I'm trying to uh, think about explaining what happens inside machine learning models because it is really hard to explain these things and sometimes you just get so frustrated with explaining to people who don't understand that you just want to say oh it's fucking magic yeah. <laughs> and sometimes that does actually work but usually it's cop out hi um, I see a lot of startups that are marketed as being powered by AI. Um, and I go talk to someone who works at that startup and I find out that there's actually a human being at the other end tweaking things and the technology is just, you know, like autocorrect. So I am wondering how much of the AI hype is a marketing tool? And maybe another way to say this is, how close is AI to replacing actual human jobs? I mean, so it's sociologically, it's probably very interesting to like trace the past 10 years and see like how like a set of terms was sort of like superseded by then like another set of terms and like AI has become a catch all, which like we would have had the exact same story 10 years ago and the word would have been software. Uh, like it is just very interesting uh, and I imagine that's for all sorts of strategic reasons, um, including marketing. Um, but I guess there's like, you know, even there's like a, still like an empirical question, which is like, what is this stuff actually able to do? And um, if you can think of it as being able to perform like very narrow, very, very narrow tasks, uh, often quite well. Um, so, you know, you can train uh, like the model to be able to like autocorrect, for instance, based on patterns of making mistakes and then figuring out what the right word is and so on. Um, but like, that's all it can do, right? Like the idea that you would build some kind of machine that is able to accomplish many different types of tasks in unconstrained environments is just like extremely distant to the point of being a kind of like a largely discounted possibility, even by engineers themselves. Um, but you know, it's just like not completely nonsense in the sense that uh, there are real things happening actually in seemingly like, you know, prestige jobs like lawyers and doctors and so on, where like strange enough, strangely enough, like these kind of rote, often manual tasks, which require like very discerning perception can blend themselves in surprising ways to some of this machine learning. So reading images, uh, you know, like CAT scans, X-rays, MRIs, 
strangely enough, like even though that's an extremely difficult job to train for and very lucrative, uh, those kinds of tasks potentially can be handled pretty well because if you show millions of images of uh, cancer to a model or to an algorithm, it will probably be able to learn the distinguishing characteristics, right? Similarly, document review, which is like the bread and butter of law firms, which pays the salary of most people who enter the corporate law firms, like that job actually also lent itself reasonably well to like establishing relevance computationally. So rather than having someone read all these emails to see which ones are relevant to a case, you can actually train a model to do a, re a reasonably good job at this. Um, and again, like what is sort of similar across these tasks are like a very narrow thing where we have lots of examples and we can train the machine to do that very narrow task quite well. But the idea that like doctors in general will be put out of business or that lawyers in general will be put out of business is just not true. It's just like not at all true. I think another interesting, uh, there's a, there was a paper that came out recently from Data and Society about moral crumple zones, uh, which I think is a really interesting concept because uh, when you have a machine learning model diagnosing cancer, who is to blame when the machine doesn't spot the cancer, right? So the engineers who design the model are not willing to take responsibility. And the company that publishes the software is not willing to take responsibility. But our entire society is set up such that if the cancer does not get detected, somebody takes responsibility, right? Like when a doctor screws up, there is a very sophisticated system in place for uh, accepting responsibility and for resolving the situation and for you know, working through things so that the, uh, the wronged party can ultimately find forgiveness and peace. Well, okay, As, in my imagination, like this is, uh, this is how it is set up. But we do actually have, like we do have systems for working through these issues, but I can't imagine the courts dealing with uh, dealing with a case of who is to blame when the machine doesn't diagnose somebody's cancer. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the excellent talks. Going back on the x-ray thing, I read something recently where they had a bunch of doctors and technicians look through x-rays and they had a little image of like a gorilla or something on there and they tried to see how many of the humans could recognize it and the number was surprisingly low, which I think is super fascinating. But um, I found the talks really, really interesting because I actually studied history and philosophy of intelligence as my concentration when I was in school. And um, I actually did my honors thesis on Alan Newell and Herbert Simon's approach to AI in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I did a historical approach to it. So um, I've always been really fascinated in trying to understand how the definition of what is intelligent changes over time. And I know that it's actually quite um, a well-known problem in AI that what is defined as intelligent changes once a machine is able to do that thing, which I think is so fascinating. So I was hoping to get your insight on that. And then um, I also want to touch upon this idea of embodied intelligence. So I do a lot of work in developmental psychology and um, a lot of my work is about affordances, so understanding how your body interacts with the world around you. And I know that for a lot of the talks that we have right now, we talk about systems that aren't physical, but I also really want to get your insight on what are some important things that we should do in fields like robotics in terms of doing intelligence research for now and the future. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just start with that uh, really fascinating set of questions. And I think this actually kind of goes back to the question about, or the conversation we're having about chess. Um, there's actually a wonderful paper by Nathan Ensmanger um, called, uh, um, I'm going to mis misremember the Latin name in it, but it's uh, what, chess as the drosophilia of AI, I believe. Drosophilia were the fruit flies that were like the default biological organisms for doing a huge array of different areas of science. And essentially asking like, how exactly did chess become such a touchstone which very much kind of speaks to to your point which is the um, the 
the tendency we have to be impressed by the doing of things that we find difficult and the uh, misunderstanding of the fundamental complexity of many things that we find easy. Um, so the process for us of being able to like navigate through space, you know, or like interpret faces um, or to uh, take up one of my favorite examples from the history of natural language processing and AI, um, Terry Winograd's work on language and especially what are called Winograd schemas, which are if I say, um, uh, I wanted to chop down the tree with this axe, but it was too... And if I say small, then you can assume that I'm talking about the axe. If I say thick, you can assume I'm talking about the tree. But that's actually extraordinarily complex to teach a machine to be able to interpret and parse in a way that it can sort of accurately communicate. Or as a student of mine pointed out literally today, the challenge for machine translation of the English language use of swear to mean either like what I was doing during my talk or like a formal oath that we take for some purpose. So these are areas that because they seem trivial to us, because of our ability to like pet a cat and be like, oh, she doesn't like that, you know? Our ability to make that inferential leap is an enormously complex matter from the perspective of trying to get a machine to do it. Whereas trying to like just brute force through a hajillion chess moves is actually not that difficult when the hardware is fast enough. So it's to say to, to your question, to your point, I think one of the things that uh, behooves us to reevaluate is how we have mistaken things that are situationally difficult for humans for being actually difficult and a sign of intelligence in general. When those things are not at all correlated, when we start to leave the domain of human intelligence. Okay, we gonna wrap up because we still have some drinks for you. So I'm gonna take Cherry's privilege and ask the last question um, for each of you. If you could very quickly, briefly respond, what is the one question you think everybody should ask about AI so that we can co-opt the AI discourse? <laughs> one, here's your mic. Oh man, I, 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 <laughs> I would ask the AI to give me a better answer. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, like this may seem very mundane, but I actually think that like in many cases, we don't really know what question the model has been designed to answer. Right? So we often like uh, talk about these things like employment, policing, and so on. But in practice, we have to be extremely specific about what we want the model to infer or predict. And it seems like a very boring question to ask, actually, what are you choosing to predict when you're making a decision about policing? What are you choosing to predict when you're making a decision about employment? And having answers to even those very basic questions, I think, could enormously improve the discourse. I think I would ask uh, if I were if I were evaluating an AI system, I would ask the creators uh, what is in the data, and then I would also ask what is not in the data, because not everything that can be counted counts. And not everything that counts can be counted. Um, that's that's quite profound. <laughs> so just thinking about that, um, uh, I um, I would I would on a social level I'll ask one question. On a personal level, a very different one. The social question would simply be to ask of AI systems: What are you actually capable of, as opposed to what purpose are you presently being put to? Sort of something somewhat related to Solon's question: Why are you just making a worse, you know, thermostat when you could potentially be doing something very different? Um, and on a purely personal level, and, and this is very much evoked by what Meredith said, um, the great cyberneticist Walter McCullough graduated from a Quaker college, and the exit interview for graduation was that you had to um, tell your examiner a question that you wanted to answer over the course of the rest of your life. And McCullough said, um, what is a number that a person can know it, and what is a person that they can know a number? And when I think about AI, I, I think I would like to ask a question like that. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. Yes, Thank please, you. a round of applause to our amazing panel. Thank you for coming out. Please join us again for the next Coopting AI events on 23rd of April on work and on 13th of May on justice. There is 
more food and drink outside. Thank you to the IPK team for putting this together and let's have more discussions about co-opting AI with some drinks and snacks. Thank you. Thank you.